want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we continue our series in 1 John chapter 3. Tonight we'll be in 1 John chapter 3. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to, uh, from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, here the, here the Apostle John in his uh, first, uh, first John uh, chapter 3 is going to talk about how we become children of Theos. And I, the, I, the reason I use the word Theos is because Theos is the name of God in, in the Greek. Because when we say God in the, in the English, God can rep represent Allah, it can be Buddha, it can be uh, many different gods. It can be your own God. It can be a, a teaching of self-help that you can just raise yourself up to be your own God. But the true God of the Greek is, is Theos. That's the supreme divinity. And that is of the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We go back to the original Hebrew. Hebrew again, Elohim grammatically can only mean three. That is the God. That is our God, the one God, Elohim, who manifests himself into three different natures. His spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, which is in us. His son, who came down to take the son away. And this is going to, and John's going to show us that this in chapter three here. So let's get into the word of God. This is very rich for our gleaning. Uh, it's just absolutely delicacy, the word of God. Praise his name. Behold, the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of Theos. Therefore, the world does not know us because he did not know him. This is amazing. Here God is. So many people get this mixed up. We are all creations of the Most High God. Through Jesus, all things were created, as the scripture tells us. And through the Father, because Christ and the Father are one. So we all are a creation of the Lord. The world is a creation of God for a test. Now to become a children, to be called his child, and to be called a friend, as Jesus says, I now call you, I no longer call you slave, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend, and have that intimacy and that love intimacy to be called a child of the Most High God, Elohim, and Theos is through the love and the love of the Son to be able to take the sins away. Then we become children. We're separated. We're set apart. Set apart for his purpose, his glory, and eternal life with him, but also set apart from the world. We can't be of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that is a huge difference. We are to be set apart for his kingdom glory. That's what John is telling us, and that's where our heart will be. God loves us so much that he gave his own begotten son that we are now called children of the most high God once we accept his son as a peace offering of grace. Praise his name. Two, beloved. When you know God calls you beloved, oh my gosh, that is the greatest that you can ever have because beloved means is love. And David was called his beloved. Beloved in Hebrew. David means beloved in Hebrew. And David is, is and was and always will be the apple of God's eye. Why? Not because of all the things he got wrong in the world. He sinned. He had iniquity. But he had contrite heart that loved the Lord his God with all his heart, his soul, and his mind. And he asked for forgiveness, and he finished the race the right way. We can't finish the race on our own. We need a Savior. And David had a Savior at this particular time uh, in the Lord, and he had a great, great love relationship with the Most High God. Praise his name. Beloved, now we are children of God. He beloved, he, he, we are loved so much. That's his intent. When he created the heavens and the earth, when he created man, let's make man in the image of Elohim. His goal was that every single person's name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Because we jump ahead if you follow our study in Revelation. We get to Revelation, the end of Revelation. You have to read this in the Greek. It says those who go to the white throne judgment, their names are removed from the book of life. Well, if you're removed from something, that means you were originally in there. And it was based on your free will and your choice to remove your own name to the world, to the second death, to the lake of fire, out of being called a child of the most high God. You chose to do that with free will of your heart because God's intention from the get-go was what created everyone and your name was in the book of life and you removed it. Another scripture says it was you dotted your you dotted you you dotted your name out of the book of life. So if you dotted it out or whited it out. 
It was originally in there. You can't white something out or dot something out unless it's originally in there. That was his intention. But to be a child, we got to give up self and have a love relationship with him. That's what he wants. That's his love. It's all about love. So if you're in a religion about, uh, uh, of, of, about rules and you don't have a love relationship, you don't have eternal life because everything John is talking about is love. It's all about unconditional agape love. However, if you love him, as John will tell us in chapter three, you need to be obedient to him. If the God Almighty gives us his precepts and his commandments and his holy word, and he says, you love me, you trust me, I expect you to be obedient. Why? Not because he's a strict father. He knows these ways are higher. He knows these ways will protect us. If David would have sat on the throne of the kingship, like he was supposed to in the Torah, and read the Torah every single day, he wouldn't have got himself in the situation with Bathsheba. He wouldn't have done it. That's why the God wants us to have the word of God on our heart so that we don't stray and do something of the flesh that God doesn't want us to do. It's not because he was saying, oh, it's glorious and, and I'm stopping you from doing it because I'm, je I'm a jealous God. No, he knows it's going to hurt us and going to hurt innocent people like Uriah. And that's why the Lord gives us his precepts and commandments. I remember the Lord gave me a prophetic word years ago during a very tough trial and tribulation. And he said, my son, this is when I was still continuing to go into sin nature and be a, a stubborn goat. And he said, my son, I give my precepts and my commandments not, not, because I love you. So I want it to go well with you. It's not to restrict you. It's because I love you. Because of the ways of the world are going to hurt you. What you think is good is not good. It's not lust. I mean, it is lust. It's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you and hurt innocent people. That's why I gave my precepts and commandments. So it will go well with you. And that's what we have to put on the tablet of our heart. Not debate them. God's ways are higher than our ways. We trust him. And then we become children of God. But you got to be all in. Love, faith, trust, obedience. Got to be all four. Now we are children of God and not yet revealed we shall be. But we know that, we, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. He's talking about Christ. So many teachers have taken this way out of context that you can, and then there's, there's cults that teach this too. I'm not going to name the cults, but you can, you can figure it out on the West Coast of the United States. Um, that you can work your way up through works to be like God. Because the scripture says, we shall see him and be like, like him. We are never going to be like the, the most high God and his son, Jesus Christ. There is a reason why. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts. There's a reason why in the Old Testament that David uh, calls him, even though he's the son of David, he calls him Lord, meaning he calls him Jehovah. We will all bow down, even those who refused him to the name of the Most High, the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts. What John is referring to is not that we will be little Jesuses and be equal with him. We will see him like he is, meaning no more sin nature, a glorified body, a, div a dimensionality that he's in today. We're in a three and a half dimensional uh, uh, dimensionality right now. So most scientists will tell you unequivocally we're at it, that, that there is a 10. Uh, I think we've mentioned in our, many of our studies in the sixth dimension uh, in quantum physics, a human body can literally walk through a wall. They're seeing that you can fold the atmosphere and you can, you can teleport. They've teleported a Coke can 60 feet. So there's dimensionalities that we haven't wrapped our arms around yet. And we do not have glorified bodies until the harpazo of the church. That's what Paul's, or that's what John is referring to. We will be like him, meaning sin is conquered. We, when we have a glorified body, we don't have the sin nature of our flesh anymore. Our decision has already been made because of our heart. We're called children of God, friends with Christ, and we will reign with him, but he is king. And we will be like him, meaning that we cannot be tempted anymore. We will be like him, meaning that our bodies won't wear down. We will be like him in his dimensionality that's outside of time and space. That's what John's referring to. If anyone who has hope in him purifies himself, he is he, uh, just as he is pure. The word hope is a bad word. It means commit to. If you commit, everybody can say, well, I got hope. I hope it doesn't rain today. Well, that's flipping a coin. And you don't flip a coin when it comes to God and Jesus Christ. It says commit to, you commit to him, it's going to be pure. 
he's, he's, he's saying you can take it. You, you can take his word as truth. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. We all miss the mark is first John 1, 9, where even though we progressively getting stronger in our walk, we're still going to fall short. That's what first John 1, 9 is. Again, highlight that in your Bible is our first teaching. That's called the Christian's bar of soap because we're going to fall. All the way until the Lord takes us home, we finish the race. Satan is going to try to come against us, and we still have sin nature in us. Even though once we get to the Bema seat, the Lord does not see our sins anymore. They're gone. But we will still be attacked, and the nature is inside our bloodstream. And that's why John is referring to we'll see him like he is when we get our glorified body. We have to have a glorified body that cannot be tempted anymore, cannot be contaminated with the sin of the bloodstream. And that's what he's referring to. So we have to continue to ask for forgiveness all the way. One who continues in sin nature, it's not sin and missing the mark. It's iniquity. You know it's sin. You know it's further than sin. You're in iniquity and you're going to do it anyway. You can't call yourself a Christian and, and, and continue in an iniquity type of manner. That's why when the Lord was getting me uh, closer and closer to him, he convicted me of, of, of drinking. My whole life, I was uh, I, I drank. I, I might have been a, a situational alcoholic, maybe. Um, I didn't drink every day, but in business, uh, that was that was part of in, in corporate America. You, you just you went out for cocktails with with, with your business clients, and and uh, I went too far, and I took it too far. And that was the thing, one of the last things the Lord was working on me, working on me, working on me. I'm trying to find a loophole. I'm trying to find, well, David David, David used to drink. King David did. Why, why can't I? So I'm trying to find a loophole in the Bible. Why can't I have five, six, seven, eight beers and go out golfing? And the Lord finally convicted me, because I'm a goat and I'm stubborn, that that's against my precepts and commandments, my son. It's better for you. So I believe it was in 2011, before we started the ministry, that he, he finally convicted me in the heart and said, mm -mm, no, you can't do that. And finally, I stopped being a goat and said, I get it, Lord. I won't do it because your ways are higher than my ways. And that's what is the difference. When you know it's wrong and you continue to do it, you're going against God's precepts and commandments. You're lawless. You're going against him. And the Holy Spirit will convict you. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. The Holy Spirit kept convicting me and convicting me and convicting me. And me and my goat mind are trying to find a loophole. Why? Well, what's wrong with just this one? Well, if you just pick this one, they all fall down. If you love him and you trust him, you're going to honor him in all things because it'll go much better for you. And it goes much better with you, you when you give that up. You think, you think you need it. You think you want it. But I've been away from it for seven years and I don't miss it one bit. And I thank God in heaven that he got this goat to finally stop that reckless behavior that went against his precepts and commandments. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there's no sin. Many false teachings today in the church, certain denominations will say, well, Mary was a holy. She was born. Uh, um, most Catholics don't even realize what this, this means. Uh, this is how blasphemy this is. It's called Immaculate Conception in the Roman Catholic Doctrine. You can even look at it in the Webster's Dictionary. It'll even explain it to you. Most Catholics... If you tell a Catholic, I would say 99% of all Catholics, if you ask them what is immaculately conceived, they'll say, well, that's the virgin birth. That's not what it means in the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. They're saying Mary was born without sin. Therefore, Mary being born without sin, she's a goddess. And if she's born without sin and the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary, who was born without sin, Christ was born without sin nature in him. That is the biggest blasphemy, one of the biggest blasphemies in the Bible, because there is only one God, and he, tra he, he transforms in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If Jesus didn't literally have sin nature in him, then why did Satan tempt him? Satan can't tempt God. So if God just came down holy as himself, Satan can't tempt him. And why would he die on the cross? That would be just a, there's no meaning to the cross. Oh, he's, he's God. He, he went to the cross and he died. He had no sin nature and he rose again. It's for nothing. And why does this, the scripture over and over and say he's of his father, David? Well, that's literal. If you start taking pieces and parts and making your own doctrine and you say, well, this is an allegory. This is an allegory. This is an allegory. Where do you stop making it an allegory? It falls apart. God means what he says and says what he means. He was born of man. 
through the line of David, literally like the Old Testament prophet said that he had to be. That's why Gabriel said in Luke, Mary, you are blessed. You will have the son of the most high God. He will be of his father, David. Me and his kingship will never end. He literally had to have the bloodline, the temptation of the sin nature come into him and take the sin to the cross once and for all. That's a literal. He will, and Gabriel continues and says, he will rule over the house of Israel forever. And it has to be a kinsman redeemer. That's the whole idea of the book, the book of Ruth. Boaz is a type of Christ. He redeemed Naomi, the Gentile bride. That's the church. He redeemed the land, which is Israel. But Naomi is Israel. Ruth is the Gentile bride. And that's why all the pieces and parts of the Bible are so important. You can't tempt somebody that, that, that can't be tempted. If, God, if Jesus came down and he was pure God and there was no sin in him, Satan's wasting his time and Satan ain't gonna, Satan's not going to waste his time tempting. You can't tempt God. He, had to have, he knew he had the sin nature in him. He knew he, that he had the, uh, the opportunity to choose, but he was half God, half man, and he took the sins to the cross. If you follow our gospel teachings, this is one of the most amazing things in the Bible. And we'll, we'll get into this because this is so important. You'll see this in all our gospel teachings on www.hisglory.tv. And this was ref referencing King David, what Jesus is going to say. Because when I was st first starting to learn the Bible, this verse troubled me greatly in my studies until the Holy Spirit showed me exactly what it means. When Jesus was on the cross, he, 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 first of all, he said three times to the, to, to the Father, take this cup if there's any other way. Meaning, there's no other way than through the blood of Christ to the cross. And it has to be sin nature. And we're going to prove it again, how precise God is in his word. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you're like, wow. Jesus is thinking God the Father fors for forsook him. That is also awfully brutal. He was quoting King David. So we don't get, we don't get the meaning of it in the, in the English because it just says like, it sounds like he's saying God twice. So we have to go to the original content of what Jesus was quoting, because Jesus is the author of the word. He, uh, he was the author of what King David wrote about this in Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, 1, and if you go into the original Hebrew, what King David, remember Jesus is before King David, even though he is the son of David, he's before King David, showing his deity and also how he had to be in the line of David through the tribe of Judah, both. So if you go and you look in the, in, the, in the exact Hebrew, this is absolutely amazing, in, in Psalm 22, 1, David said, David was also a prophet. He was, prophet. he was a prophet and a king. He said, my El, my El, why have you forsaken me? So El is the singular term of God, rarely used to, to show God in his glory. 99% of the time in the Old Testament, God is referred to as Jehovah or Elohim. Those are the two who are in the, in the, in the, uh, the Jewish part of it, uh, you, you, uh, Hashim or uh, Yahweh. That's just another version of uh, uh, Yehovah. Um, but very rarely does it refer to God as El. El is the singular of God. That's why when he named Bethel, the, the house of God, that would be Bethel. That's why it's called Bethel. So if you really think about this, the Holy Spirit's not, or the, the God is not saying, saying this twice, just to say it. He's telling us something very, very unique here. That Jesus had sin nature in him, but yet he never sinned. He had to take it to the cross to redeem as the, as the Lamb of God because of the sin that was brought into the world by Adam and the sin that we have. And if we deny we have sin, then, then we are liars, as John is teaching us in this chapter. So Jesus had to take it to the cross, literally, the sin nature. In that moment in time where he took the sin to the cross, he was separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit because of the holiness of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, that's why he said, literally said, my L, my L, why have you forsaken me? The Father and the Holy Spirit were separated at that moment of time that Jesus literally took the power of sin on the cross as the second of the, of the Godhead 
to eternity because the blood had to be redeemed. See how deep the Lord goes? It was absolutely a triumph that he had to do that. And that moment in time, the pain that Jesus had to take on and literally be separated from a holy father and a holy, holy spirit so that he could take these sins to the cross for us and then be redeemed once and for all to be called a child of God, to be called friends of the Christ. That's why. It's literal. Everywhere you look, deeper you peel it back, literal, 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 beyond literal. And you know, it manifested to take away sins and he, he, in him there are no sin. He was with sin, but never sinned. He is the only one that could take sin nature and not sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin, but whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So if anyone continues to have iniquity and continues to sin and says, I'm a Christian, they are not, says John, says the word of God. To love me is to trust me. To love me is to have obedience in my commandments. How many of them? All of them, because I am God. I am the beginning and the end. I know better than you do, my son and daughter. And my purpose is not to harm you. It's to show you love and to show you things that are outside of time and space that are going to hurt you. That's why I tell you my precepts and commandments. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteous is righteous, just as he is righteous. Don't let anybody deceive you. If you got to walk the walk, you got, if you talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. You can't fool God. You can't say this is the way it's supposed to be, but live a different life. You have to have the glory of God and be obedient to his precepts and commandments. And you know what? We have sin nature in us. We're going to fall short. And our, the more we get into the Lord, the more we pray, the more we get into meditation, the, the, the closer and closer we get, the less, the less, the less. But still it's there, it's there, it's there. And if you're a threat to Satan, Satan's going to throw more temptation at you. That's one time when I was just naive and starting to learn the Bible and I was teaching a Bible class. I said, I don't care what Satan throws at me. You know what? I got Jesus Christ in me and I, I, nothing's going to tempt me. That was the stupidest thing that I could have ever said. That was ignorant and that was arrogant and that was absolutely stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. You don't want to test Satan to say, look at me. I, I'm, I'm incapable of sin. Yeah, 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 come after me. You don't want to spark the evil one up to throw trials and tribulations in your life. We have enough arrows that come on us in life. We can't be, we have to be humble. We can't say anything obnoxious is what I said years and years and years ago. That's a spiritual, that's a spiritual walk. The closer we get to him, the more he matures us in our walk. And we don't say stupid things like I said years, years ago that I don't want to be tempted because I know he can tempt me. And he wants to tempt me and he wants to destroy me. So I got to keep my eyes focused, heart on Jesus Christ and walk that straight path because I know I'm going to slip a little bit. And when I slip, that's where 1 John 1, 9 is to get me back on, to stay on track and keep on track, get in his word, get in his meditation and get in prayer. Lord, do not give me temptation. That's why he said in the Lord's prayer, deliver me from temptation and the evil one. Because when the evil one tempts you, He's ready to devour. He says, look at that. Just a little bit. It's okay. And you start looking at him and you start falling and falling and falling. And your eyes are not on the Lord. Your heart's not on the Lord. Satan's going to win. So don't ask and say you're ever above temptation. We're not until we finish the race and have a glorified body. That's the only time that we will be without being tempted. He who sins is of the devil. And the, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. He was sinned because of pride. And he would be like the most high God and he is a dece deceiver and destroyer. He's going to deceive, destruct, and destroy. And he knows those who have a high calling. Just like the Bible said in, in the book of Job. And he did it to Abraham in the book of Yasser too. You see my boy Job? He's upright and righteous. And Satan's going, oh yeah? <laughs> Let me at him. <laughs> Poor Job. But Job didn't call himself upright and righteous. God was going to test Job because he knew the beginning and the end. And Job was like, God, dude, you don't need, that's okay. Don't, you don't need to speak for me. I don't need to go through these trials and tribulations. But in these trials and tribulations, it's where he molds us, shapes us, gets us. But Satan's going to tempt us. That's why the Lord's prayer is, deliver me from temptation and deliver me from the evil. And we don't want to be tempted because Satan will try to sift us. S Satan sifted Peter. We don't want that temptation. But if you are a threat, as Job's a threat, Peter's a threat, 
Abraham was a threat. We see in the book of Yasser, Satan's going to come after you because you are a threat. If you are a threat, Satan has you in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in, in the hairline. He's got you in a scope because God is telling him, you're this, this man or woman is favored by the Lord. You're going to, you're going to sift him, Satan, but I already know what he's going to do. I already knew what Job was going to do at the end. I know what my, my I know what my be beloved David's going to do at the end. I know what all my, my people are going to do because I know the beginning and the end. Whoever has been born of God, born again, spiritually born. That's why when you're born again, you're, you're a new creation. You're born again, you're a, new, you're a good tree that bears good fruit, does not sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born again of theos. Now some will say, well, see, once you're born of God, sin cannot affect you. It's not what he's saying. He's saying continuous to sin in one hand. And the other is that God has blotted it out because you've asked for forgiveness of your sins. Your sins are washed away in the eyes of the Lord. But sin will be at your door. What the Greek word is here is saying, continuance, because we all do. And Jesus says, how many times will I be forgiven? 70 times seven. So if we have a contrite heart and we sin in the same way, say it's an addiction. And the addiction comes against you again. And addictions are very difficult and you sin seven times against the Lord, but your heart is contrite. Is that iniquity when you ask for forgiveness in the first John uh, 1, 9? No, because he knows the condition of your heart. He knows that, that there's temptation, especially through, through vices of drug and alcohol and all kinds of addictions that Satan has thrown into the world through the sin nature to try to get us off course. He's saying anyone that continues in sin, that's why we have to reach the Lord and ask for forgiveness. But the, it's got to be contrite from the heart. You, just, you can't just sin and say, God, forgive me. I, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, this is easy. Okay, so if I do something wrong, and, and my parents, I, 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 take, uh, I take something that's not supposed to be mine, all I have to do is say, I'm sorry, Lord, and it's, I'm forgiven. <laughs> First of all, there's, there's two things that have that. One, sin has a repercussion. So when you sin, God the Father has going to have a natural repercussion in your life because of that. You don't know what's coming, but it will come because God wants to keep you in line. Because if there wasn't a repercussion, you would continue to do it. Just like David with Bathsheba. David with the census. There was a natural repercussion because of his sin. He got him back in line. And he's focused his heart on the Lord. And then he's saying, also, if you continue in that same type of sin nature and your heart is not contrite to ask for forgiveness and just instead of it glibly just say, I'm sorry, God. He knows if you're just saying, I'm sorry, God. He knew, he knew Sarah didn't believe him when he said, you're going to have a child because the scripture says she laughed within herself. She didn't laugh out loud. Most, most people, when you read that, you think, well, Sarah laughed out loud. That's why he knew. No, she didn't laugh out loud. She laughed inside. He knew her heart. He knew exactly what she was thinking and she knew the condition of her heart. There was, there's no way, I'm 90 years old, there's no way I'm gonna have a child. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But she never showed that outwardly because he knows the heart. He knows if you're true or not. And it's gotta be true. For this is the message you heard from the beginning that we should love one, love one another. This is the message of the entire Bible is agape, a love, 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 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who commits to, not the English word that believes in, because Satan and the demons believe in Christ, commits their heart to him, shall have everlasting life and be like him with a purified body, a glorified body, and be incapable of sin nature and eternity forever and live in the dimensionality that he is. Not to be little Jesus is running around. No, we're called friends. And we're called children of God. We don't say, move over, God. Here I am. Look what I've done. No, that's not humility. He is the glory. It's always his glory. Remember the commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, which is your essence, and then your mind. And Jesus even took it a step further. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Why did he say strength? because he wanted you to walk with him, 
Not just to say, I love the Lord. He's in my DNA. He's in my mind. I'm just going to sit back, put my feet up, eat Cheetos, and let the Lord come when he comes. No, he said all your strength, all your strength needs to be direct, directed towards me so that you walk the walk, not talk the talk. You walk hand in hand and be that good fruit that bears, or that good tree that bears good fruit of Galatians 5.22. We are to be walking with him. That's what James says. Show me gr grace, then I'll show you works. It's got to go hand in hand. It's grace and works. It's not just grace and no works. And it's not just works to get grace. It's got to be grace because it's a free gift. But because of our love for him, it compels us to do and walk. Because Jesus said, your strength. And not as Cain, who was wicked one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Some of our versions of our Bible will say that he was of the devil. So we don't know the condition of Cain's heart. Obviously, Cain sinned. Okay, no question. He created murder. We don't know the condition of Cain's heart towards the end. Some of the scripture makes it sound like here that he, he never accepted the Lord. We do know from the book of Yasser that Cain did repent of the, the, the death of his brother, but we don't know the condition of his heart towards the end of his life. Okay, some of these repentance can be an emotional repentance. Some of these salvation calls can be emotional calls salvation calls it didn't the seed never stuck is like jesus said the seed has to be on good ground and then the holy spirit lets it grow there are many people who have said they've been baptized but are not saved because you have to truly be born again and you have to walk a new life you are a new creation you're a new tree a good tree that bears good fruit and it's a progress you're a work in progress each year are you getting closer to god and sin becoming less, less, less? Or is it stagnant or are you going backwards? We do this in the corporate world. We always do postmortems every quarter. And you do postmortem upon postmortem and post. It's funny, it's called postmortem. Because I grew up in the funeral industry. My great my my grandfather was a funeral director, so my entire life I grew up in the in the in the funeral business. So postmortem is to, to look at the body and see what how, what the cause of death was, what went wrong, and that's what we call in the corporate world. We should be doing the same thing because we don't want to get to death and it's too late. We should be doing a postmortem probably every day. Am I getting closer to God today or am I going back or staying neutral? Because Jesus said, you need to have the bread of life every day. You need the living water every day. So we should be doing this postmortem every day when you pray at night, before you pray and you meditate on the Lord. Did I get closer to you today or were I farther away or was I neutral? Or did I feel you more in my life? And then we make an adjustment the next day when we wake up, when he gives us the grace to wake up. And what we did wrong, we've, we've repented in our prayer. That's key. That is so key. And a lot of times in my prayer at night, I say, Lord, please fill me in and give me wisdom of the sins that I'm creating without me knowing because I'm a sinner. I know I'm sinning in ways that I don't maybe understand. Make them understandable to me so that I can repent and not do that because there's nothing I want to do to you, Lord, because you are my God and I love you with all my heart and soul and mind to let you down. When you love God so much that you don't want to let him down, you're on the right path. It's a long path. You're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be attacked. You got to keep going, but that's a good sign. That's a good, good sign. So uh, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. The world's going to hate you. The world is of Satan. We are set apart for the glory of God and become children of God. We, the world is going to hate us. They can't coexist. They can't. You cannot be in the world and in Christ. You got to be of the world in Christ. Be that light to the rest of the world as Christ was that light. Sharing the gospel, planting the seed. But you can't walk in the nature of the world and what the world wants. What we are looking for are riches in Christ Jesus because of love. What the world is looking for is riches in self with a different God, with lifting yourself up or silver or gold or whatever it may be. It's contradicting itself. We know that we have passed from death to life. We have passed from the second death to eternal life once we have him. As I've said many times, if I die, 
on this broadcast that's going out to every single country in the world today, it might go viral. Um, there's no question my next breath will be in heaven because I have passed from death to life because of his love and his trust. I have the faith. I have the love. I know where I'm going. He's lifted me up. He's shown me these things. And I have no doubt. He's given me a taste of heaven and a vision of him. I have no doubt. And that's where every single person has to get. If you're thinking, if I die today, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven. That's a bad sign. You should know without a doubt. If you're in Christ, you know, because you can take it to the bank. Is he in you or not? And if you say, I don't know, then you need to take it to him because you should know. He's telling us, you will know if you know me. Know my word and you will know your eternal address. It's with me, my child. He passed from death to life because we love the brother. He who does not loves his brother abides in death. Death. Love your brother as, your, as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And, who, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You can't have hate. You got to have forgiveness. That's why it's a hypocritical for the church. Somebody that says is a Christian that, but holds a grudge against somebody else. You can't hold a grudge no matter what they've done to you and wronged you. Whether it's a parent, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a, a spouse, ex-spouse. Uh, it doesn't matter what they've done. You ask for forgiveness and you forgive them and you pray for them. If you are still in emotional or in physical harm from that particular person, you distance yourself from them so they cannot hurt you physically or emotionally anymore, but you have to forgive. You have to forgive because if you don't forgive, then why do what? Then Christ died on the cross for nothing. He forgave us and we've, far, we've done far worse than all of this. And a lot of Christians don't want to give up the forgiveness part. They want to have the grace of Christ, but yet they want to, they want to hold a grudge against somebody else. That's not of Christ. That's not having a true heart. Jesus, what did he say? He said, if you can't forgive, then I won't forgive you. Forgiveness is based on the condition of a heart. You have to forgive. Do not let today go of holding another grudge. Pray for that particular person that might have harmed you and that you have a grudge against and ask the Lord forgiveness of that grudge and pray that off for that person today. And if you're in physical or mental harm because of that situation, you distance yourself. You don't let them hurt you anymore, but you're not gonna have that cloud of sin over you that you won't forgive them because you pray for them to know the living Lord. But this we know, besides he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Give up your life for a, for a, a, a further, a, another brother. You do that, I'm a former Marine. You know, we're sworn in as Marines uh, to, to protect our country. And as a Marine, you give up your, your life for another Marine. And that's just of the physical, or the, you know, the, the worldly way. How much more is that of Christ, that you know where your home's gonna be, that you're gonna give up your life because you know where you're gonna be to save someone else's life. It's all about saving the soul. We're in the soul-saving business. I saw somebody the other day on Twitter and he called himself an eternal planner. That is so, so neat. It is. We are, if you're a pastor or called to glorify God, we're eternal planners. You know, you have a financial planner or you'll have a health planner, but what's the most important thing? Eternal plan. Where is your eternal life going to be? And that's what we have to look to. Where is our eternal plan going to be? Is it a child of God or away from him and removed from the book of life? It's based on our heart. I'd rather worry about my eternal plan than my financial plan or my health plan. It's all about where my life's going to be when the music stops. But whoever has the world's goods sees his brothers in need, shut up his heart from him, but does not, have, but does not love God, abide in him. They have living for the world's goods. My little children, let us not love in the word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. <laughs> so true. Don't just, don't just say... I'll pray for you. How many people that, that have seen, they just say, I'll pray for you, okay? We, we, need to do, we, we need to show action. Yeah, we have to literally pray for them. There's sometimes there's nothing we can do, but we just don't glibly say, we'll pray for you and not pray for them and not care. We gotta pray. You have to take it to the prayer warrior team that we have a nine prayer warriors at His Glory that the prayer requests come in and the prayer warriors pray over these particular situations all over the world. Every time I get a prayer, prayer request, I say a prayer personally. It's not a long prayer, but I say a prayer. 
we don't just glibly go and then there's something that the Lord inspires us to do to help, we do that. We had uh, Pastor Fred in his glory, uh, uh, Kenya, just recently, our pictures have been up there. Uh, it, it was almost killed by the grace of God. He was saved on a motorcycle accident, but I had a huge medical bill. We didn't have the finances to do it. I didn't know how we were gonna pay for it, but the Holy Spirit said, we need to take care of Pastor Fred. And we did it. Now we gotta figure out a way to pay for it. But that's what we have to do in brothers instead of just praying for you. There's times we gotta take action. But the Holy Spirit said, he needs help and you can help him, help him. Don't worry about how you're gonna get it back. Lord will take care of it. That's where the heart, instead of just praying, we're taking action. More Christians need to take action in their life. Not just, oh, I'll pray for you. That's, that's just, you're better off just telling me the truth. Hey, I don't care and I don't have the time. Have a nice day. Instead of, oh, I'll pray for you. And that's what's made the church hypocrites. We need the love. Remember what John's saying about the love? It's love, it's love, it's love. If it's love, you'll take action. And by this we know that we are truth and we shall assure our hearts before him. He knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows what we want in our hearts and we know it. he knows if it's for him, for his purpose. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. The Holy Spirit is the one that shows us and guides us, our guideposts in our heart. That's why we wanna activate the Holy Spirit in us so that we know when the Holy Spirit comes on and then gives us the unction that we need to do something got to follow that if it's of God and we how do we know if it's God if is it based on his precepts and commandments are we going to step out of our uh, 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 of our um, comfort zone and lift somebody up and pray for them or uh, you know hand them something a gift so many people say well you know I don't I don't know if God really wanted me to go speak to that person and give them a, a little bit of comfort and joy and say God bless you can I pray for you I, I, I didn't get a word I didn't get a prophetic word to tell me I should do that Hello, you don't need God to tell you to do that. It's love. Take action. You don't think Jesus would go over to that person and pray for them? We're not like we're not we're not little Jesuses. But that you don't have to have confirmation to go over and say, "Hello, how can I help you? God loves you, and can I pray for you?" It's what we have to do. Take action. Sometimes we wait for all these signs. Well, if there's 75 cardinals that come down on me right now and fall all over my desk, then I'll go over and say a prayer with that person because they look like they're hurt. No, no. There's times that we need confirmation from the Lord to do something outside of our normal, but there are the, 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 the no-brainers, the, the, the full of harders that you have to do. You have to do. If you walk in Christ, you have to do it. That's what he called us to do, to be the light. Because so many people would never do that. And you go over to them and you pray for them. They're, they look and they look around and they go, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that. This person came out of nowhere and said, can I pray for you? Can I help you? Can I, can I, you're, I it seems like you're having a, 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 a struggle. Lift them up. That's what we're called to do. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards Theos. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Not whatever we ask for our material gain. Remember, our riches are in Christ Jesus. God may bless us with financial windfalls, okay? If he does... It's based on the condition of our heart. And if he does, it's for his purpose and his glory. It's not for us to become rich. It never called us to be rich. Abraham was rich. David was rich. Isaac was rich. Jacob became rich. Okay. But they used it for his purpose and his glory. God will bless you maybe financially and you can be rich of things, but you're supposed to spread that wealth to, to, to spread his glory. That's what it's all about. He's never going to say you can become a Christian and you'll be rich and everything's gonna be fine and you can just sit back. I had uh, somebody come to me a couple months ago and said, uh, I, I hear uh, through Christianity, if I become a Christian, I, all my problems will go, go away and, and I'll be rich. Uh, I wanna be a Christian. This was a Muslim that came up to me. Can you, can you ask me to receive Christ because I wanna be rich? I had to say, no, 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 that's not how it works. It's a relationship. He's not saying you'll be rich. You'll be rich in him for eternal life. We don't do it for money. We don't do it for anything other than love. That's what we have to show the world. It's about love. We can't listen to these false teachers and say, oh, if you put me tithe $10,000, you know, God's going to give you $50,000. Should you tithe $10,000 if you have, have it? If God tells you to, yeah. But don't expect something back. God will bless you 
but you're not doing it as a reinvestment. You're not doing it as a stock portfolio. That if I invest 10,000 in God stock here, that God stock over the course of three years will give me X, Y, Z return. He's not a stock market. He's a God of love. And he balances the justice based on the condition of your heart. And this, and, and this is a commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. The word here is not believe. It's commit to because demons and Satan believe. We need to commit to the name of his son, Christ the Messiah. And love one another. Love everyone. Even Jesus said, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Samaritan. The, 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 the ones that the Jews hated the worst. So he's saying, love your enemy. Pray for them. Lift them up. If somebody comes after you and you pray for them and you just smile, that's the worst thing that could pop. I mean, that's the, that's the best thing that could happen to them. And that's where we have joy, peace, hope in the Lord. We don't fight back in, that, in the anger. We walk away. And uh, <laughs> I mentioned this before as Marines, and this is not the same thing. So don't take it as, as this is the physical world. When we were Marines and um, we were stationed in uh, Japan, we guarded the Seventh Fleet, Naval Fleet. Uh, so we were security forces to the uh, communications of the Seventh Fleet out the Persian Gulf. So we are on a naval base, and there was only there's probably 30 of us Marines that guarded tens of thousands of Navy people. So we would go to the Navy Club, and there might be five of us Marines because Marines are always on guard somewhere. And we would be in a rotation and we'd be gathering up about a hundred people come against us. And all these Navy guys thought they were tough coming against Marines. Oh, you're a Marine. Let's see what you do now, Marine. So what you would do, you would go up to the biggest one and have the biggest one come forward and say, you take the, 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 tur the first punch. And they would hit us as hard as they could. And they'd hit you right in the face and you'd stand and you'd just smile. And you should see the face of the hundred uh, Navy people just go, uh-oh. And that's not what you want to do in the human world. Because, but the, with, in a way, that's what Jesus is saying. Take it on the other cheek and smile. Not smile as in revenge, but smile in, you know what? I'm going to take it and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Because you'll get the negative, you'll get the reverse reaction. Instead of fighting back, you're seeing we're fighting, we're, we're, we're praying for. And that's what loving your neighbor means. Turning that negative and that darkness into light. And now when we close out in verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandment abides by him. Uh-oh, I don't like this part. Many Christians don't like this part. It says keep his commandments. All of them. It didn't say keep commandments on half of them, 10 of them. I'll tie them the commandments. I think I'll take 10 part of the commandments and obey them. No, he says now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. He is with him. Because you know it's for your own, your own good and he is a God of love. And these commandments are so it will go well with you and protect you and, and get closer to him. He's a holy God. The closer we can get to him by following his commandments, whether it's quitting, drinking, whatever it may be that has been an obstacle be, between agape love between you and the Lord, you gotta be obedient to him because then he'll abide in you and you in him. That's so crucial. Not some of them, all of them. And Christians need to know that. There's only about 10% 10, 10 that are doing this. And, not, and there are not enough pastors out there today telling truth. They're not going to say this about the commandments because it's going to offend the church. Well, they're not going to tie it to my church. They don't want to hear about sin. Perfect driven church. I mentioned this before. Well established church book. How to run a mega church. Don't call it sin. Call it unchurched. No, it's sin. God doesn't want it, but you can have restoration. He said, follow all my commandments. You love me, you follow all, com all commandments. Pump in oxygen, make it like a, like a casino. Get your good rock bands and get your lattes. Make it fun. Make it, like a, like, it like, like a country club. And don't put the cross up because you don't want to offend anybody. It's his church. He's the head, that's a building. And, it's, and, <laughs> and don't have any altar calls. We don't want to put people on notice. You're not saving souls. You're a building and you're a country club. There is only one church and the church is the body. We are called 
to bring people in on altar calls. We are called to have the foundation of the cross as our moral compass. As Jesus said to the lake of, or the church of Laodicea, this is the last days. This is the last church. Because when you study our, our teaching in the book of Revelation on the church of Laodicea, where is Jesus? He's knocking at the door of the church because they've taken Jesus out of the church or the building in this case. Jesus is the head, always will be the head. And he is the cross, the moral compass of our heart. And he abides in us, and, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he've given us. He abides in us through the Holy Spirit. That's why we pray for the gifts of the spirit to uplift, activate the Holy Spirit. That's why so many denominations, it's sad. It's absolutely sad that they deny the gifts of the spirit or take a neutral level of the spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you when you're born again and become a new creation. Don't you wanna activate that spirit? Don't you wanna have the nine gifts of the spirit? Don't you want the gift, the gift of lifting up, encouraging, the gift of wisdom and knowledge that can only come from the Holy Spirit? Don't you want the, the, the Holy Spirit to intercede and make groanings on your behalf that you to pray for things that you don't know what to pray for? Don't you want the Holy Spirit to say, my son, my daughter, that's getting off the path. That's not right. That's your moral compass to say, wait a minute, I shouldn't be doing that. I need to be on God's word. Activate the Holy Spirit. God gave, him the, gave us the counselor through his son, the third part of the Trinity. Activate the Holy Spirit. We pray that 1 John 3 has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Apostle John bless you today and always. God bless you.